Our Father, we are um, cognizant of the days in which we're living, and we are aware of the issues that are taking place in this nation and the fissures and the splits and the insanity that is taking place, and we wonder how it can hold together. But it's also true that we in our history have had other times like this, and we would say to you tonight that our hope is in you. And when times get confusing and when foundations are shaken and we wonder how long things can go on the way that they are, we just come back to you. As we saw last week, the nations rage in Psalm 2, but you rule and reign. And we thank you, Lord, that regardless of what happens in the world, that you have called us to be in your church, and we are to be set apart. We're in the world, but we're not of the world we're to live differently. Uh, We are to live acknowledging that Jesus is our king and the Bible is our constitution. Not that we're not good citizens. We're called in scripture to submit to authority and to be good citizens. But you are the ultimate king and the ultimate ruler and you have given us your word. And as we walk through difficult times and Uh, desperate times and dark times, your word, thy word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So tonight we are back to look into your word, to study. There's the wisdom of man and there's the wisdom of God. And in your word, we find your wisdom, which is superior, which is supreme, which um, tells us the truth and enables us to live skillfully as we listen carefully to what you say and then we seek to apply it. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you for your care. We thank you that you walk us through the ups and downs of life. And there are ups and downs. There are good times and there's much favor that we enjoy from your hand. But there are also times when our hearts are broken There are times when we're fighting off depression. There are times when it seems like your hand has been withdrawn from us. But those are just seasons where we are in the wilderness and where we are driven to seek you. And it's in those hard times that the deep, deep, valuable lessons of life are learned. So, tonight, minister to each man as we open your word. Each guy has different needs, facing different issues, and in the midst of different circumstances, but your word is sufficient for all, and you're a great Savior. So, we ask tonight that you'll encourage us, that you'll give us hope, that you'll give us wisdom for the next step that we need to take and that you'll put joy in our hearts regardless of what we're facing because you'll never leave us or forsake us. That's our prayer tonight. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So tonight we are moving along, we are trekking through the Psalms, and we are in Psalm 3. Psalm 3 is, uh, is a brief psalm, but the, these psalms, you know, it's, it's easy just to read through a psalm and just blow through it. But the fact of the matter is, these psalms are power-packed. 
they have uh, immense value. They have immense practicality. Uh, they're chock full of uh, nutrients, of, of antioxidants, of all the essentials in terms of spiritual nutrition that we need to get through life. So what we're going to have tonight in Psalm 3, if, if I was to title this right now, I would title it Outnumbered, Overwhelmed, and Out of Options. I'm gonna, this is a very dark chapter in David's life. The events surrounding Psalm 3. So, one, two, three, four, five, six points tonight. The first one is David's catastrophe, verses one through two. Secondly, David's confidence is found in verse three. Third, David's cry to God is in verse four. Fourth, David's calm, his ability to sleep is in verse five. Fifth point, we find David's courage in verse six in the midst of the catastrophe. And the sixth point would be David's call to battle in verses seven through eight. Let's read Psalm three, and I'm not gonna begin with verse one. I'm gonna begin with the uh, superscription that's above verse one. In the Hebrew text, uh, that is verse one, the superscription. So we read this. Morning prayer of trust in God is the theme, but here's the superscription. A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. So we got a historical context that we'll come back to in a minute. O Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul that there is no deliverance for him and God. When this kind of thing happens in our lives, it can be a business, it can be in a family, it can be uh, in a multitude of ways where we si suddenly find ourselves on the receiving end of uh, great criticism and great um, vitriol. And we are the enemy in a lot of people's eyes. That is a very uncomfortable place to be. And where we are right now in this nation, if you take a stand for Christ, more and more this is going to be what Christians are going to experience in this country. Verse 3, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept. By the way, because of the way my text is laid out, I missed two words. Go back to verse two, and at the end of verse two, it says, there is no deliverance for him and God, and then it says, Selah. Mine is off to the right, and it's easy to miss it as I did, even though I've noted it here. And then look at verse four, at the end of verse four, he answered me from his holy mountain, Selah. What does Selah mean? It's, it's a pause. It's a rest. Uh, for what reason? To think, to ponder, to meditate. What is going on? It's just not talking. It's just not praying to the Lord. But it's pondering. It's chewing. It's considering. He goes on and says in verse 5, I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. He's surrounded. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. And there it is again, Selah. Pause, reflect, meditate, consider 
these things. As I mentioned, this is a very, very dark chapter in David's life. Biographically, the chapter, uh, this psalm is related to what we find in 2 Samuel, uh, chapters 15 through 19. David was not a perfect man. None of us are. We're all sinners, all who sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. David was a man after God's own heart. David truly had a heart for God, but he was a flawed man as we are flawed. Made a lot of mistakes, uh, had a lot of regrets. Undoubtedly, as a father, he looked back and had a lot of regrets. I don't know any father who doesn't have regrets. I don't know any father who can hear a message on fathering who doesn't feel guilty because we tend to look back and see all the mistakes and all the shortcomings, and I should have known this if I had known what I know today back then, but see, I didn't know it back then, and it's just... So we all, because we're flawed in our leadership of our homes, we all have flawed families, and there are no perfect families. There are no families that have it completely together. There are just families. Broken families, flawed families, made up of sinners. David David was told, as all the kings were in Deuteronomy 17, that the king of Israel was just to have one wife. David broke that. David had somewhere between eight to 12 wives. And when you have wives, you get kids. Now, you think back to your house just this past Christmas. You got everybody in. And uh, I don't know how many kids you have. I don't know how many grandkids. Some of you guys have great-grandchildren. But uh, you get all those people together, and it's a zoo. It's just crazy. Now, factor in 8 to 12 wives. And the kids. And the grandkids. And what you've got, when you factor in multiple wives and multiple kids, what you've got are rivalries, you've got jealousy, you've got uh, competition, you've got uh, hatred in some cases, you've got... When David sinned with Bathsheba, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, and not only sinned with Bathsheba, but had her husband Uriah murdered by putting him on the front lines and having the other soldiers pull back from him. Uh, David covered that up for a year, and then Nathan the prophet called him out, and then David came clean. After covering it, he came clean, he repented. There was a godly sorrow. There was a fake repentance And there's a genuine repentance. Thomas Watson used to say that genuine repentance is the vomiting of the soul. It's the the dry heaves of the soul. It's not a flippant, oh, I'm sorry, or oh, I I regret that. If it hurts you, I'm sorry. That's, That's not repentance. That's putting a piece of scotch tape on something and trying to move on. But there is a, the scripture says that true repentance is a godly sorrow. It's, it's a sadness. It's a, it's a grief over your sin. And if there was any way you could go back and undo it, you would. You hate it. Uh, David covered it, was faking it, for at least a year after he married Bathsheba. And then Nathan called him out. And then in Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, you have those two psalms which record his genuine, genuine, from the gut repentance before Almighty God. He was forgiven, but God also said that there would be consequences as a result of this that David would live with for the rest of his life uh, as a result of sin. And there are always consequences to sin. We, We turn to the Lord, we're forgiven, but there are consequences. And God God in his mercy, whatever those consequences are, he will give us grace to bear those consequences. But lessons are learned 
through hard consequences. One of the things that happened in David's family with this rivalry, he had a son who lusted after his half-sister, actually conned her into coming in and nursing him that he was sick. He then raped her. Then he would have nothing to do with her. Absalom decided he was going to get even with that half-brother, took his time, put together an ambush, pulled it off, killed the brother. Um, There's a lot of family history in this psalm. And then what happened was that Absalom was on the run. David was too easy with him. There's just a lot of family history behind this. But it's his son Absalom who caused one of the darkest chapters of David's life because he pulled off, he almost pulled off a coup to unseat David as king. Um, What you find is if you turn to 2 Samuel 15, you'll get a little bit of background on this. We won't spend a lot of time on it. Uh, Warren Wearsby has made a great comment. He said, David was a genuine hero. David was a man after God's own heart. David was a tremendous warrior. Uh, David united the tribes of Israel. David uh, cared for his men, cared for his people. Yeah, he was flawed, but David did a lot of things right. He was, uh, he was a man's man who had a heart for God. He was a genuine, self-sacrificing hero. His son Absalom was a celebrity. That's it. He would, Absalom would do really well in our culture today. He's just a celebrity. He's just a good-looking guy with a lot of gifts. And uh, the only thing on his resume, Absalom, celebrity, and what qualified to be him to be a celebrity? That he was a celebrity. That's all he had. You read, uh, actually, 2 Samuel 14, verse 25. Now in all Israel, no one was as handsome as Absalom, so highly praised from the sole of his feet, from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no defect in him. Sort of like you. (laughs) Sort of like me. I mean, this guy was perfect. Don't you hate guys like that? You just want to slap them. But that's Absalom. When he cut the hair of his head, and it was at the end of every year that he cut it, for it was heavy on him. So he cut it, he weighed the hair, the hair of his head at 20, uh, 200 shekels by the king's weight. And then you go on and you get more information on him. It gets interesting in chapter 15. Now it came about after this that Absalom provided for himself a chariot and horses and 50 men as runners before him. This is where he begins the coup. His dad is busy uh, in Jerusalem leading the nation, and he's working behind his dad uh, under the radar trying to set this coup up. Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. That's where all the business of the community took place, financial, uh, transactions, all business, a lot of uh, court stuff. Anyway, he would hang out at the gate. He would rise early, stand beside the way to the gate, and when any man had a suit to come to the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, from what city are you? And he would say, well, your servant is from one of the cities, uh, the tribes of Israel. And Absalom would say to him, see, your claims are good and right, but no man listens to you on the part of the king. He's undercutting his dad, very subtly, but he's working against his dad. Moreover, Absalom would say, oh, that one would appoint me judge in the land. And then every man who has any suit or cause could come to me, and I would give him justice. And when a man came near to prostrate himself before him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom dealt with all Israel who came to the king for judgment. Watch this. So Absalom stole away the hearts of the men of Israel. This went on for four years. Verse 7, 
it'll say at the end of 40 years, there's probably a note in your Bible in the margin that should be four. This went on for four years. And then he launched his coup, and he tried to take down his dad. Uh, why, why would Absalom, why would he do this? Why would he do it? Eric Geiger uh, writes some very good stuff, and he had a post that I saw this week, and basically it was the four root idols that corrupt leaders. The four root idols that corrupt leaders. Doesn't matter what kind of leader you are, uh, every guy in here is a leader because if you're a husband and a father, you're a leader. You might not even view yourself as a leader, but God has appointed you to lead your home and your family and the ways of God, in the ways of Christ. Um, you might be middle management. Uh, you're still a leader in some way, shape, or form. You have a sphere of influence that God has given to you. So four idols that corrupt leaders, and they corrupted Absalom. The first one is power, which is a longing for influence or recognition. A longing, a deep desire. Lord Acton said... Um, all power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. He wanted that absolute power. He wanted to be king. Uh, the second idol is control, a longing to have everything go according to my plan. Third, the idol of comfort, a longing for pleasure, more pleasure than I have now. And if I've got a lot, I still want more. The fourth idol is approval. A longing to be accepted or desired. This is all very similar to what we looked at last week, selfish ambition, which is what was in Satan's heart and can very easily get in our hearts. So this is what drove Absalom to try and pull off this coup. Now, I will tell you this, we're not going to spend any more time on Absalom except to say that eventually he was hunted down and he was defeated and he was killed. But he almost pulled this thing off. So that leads us to our first point in the outline. David's catastrophe we find in verses 1 through 2 back in Psalm 3. Oh Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Why? Because Absalom has been running around the country for four years uh, making friends and influencing people and undercutting me, and I had no idea this was going on. Uh, my adversaries have increased. He was winning the hearts of the men of Israel, men who had been for David, men who had fought for David, men who were advisors to David. He wound up getting David's top counselor to, to betray David and to come into his camp. I mean, this guy was winsome. This guy was good. This guy knew how to read people, and he knew how to work people. So David says, oh, Lord, this is the catastrophe, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. The word adversary actually has the idea of those who hunt me. Uh, David is being hunted down. And Absalom is getting a, a grassroots surge comprised of hundreds and hundreds. And it's growing by the day. Many are rising up against me. Not a few, many. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God. Many are, are, are basically behind, I mean, you read between the lines, they're saying, yeah, now David's getting what he deserved because what he did with Bathsheba and then Uriah, because that had all gotten out. Oh yeah, there, uh, uh, he, he's getting his just desserts and and. And there's no way God's going to deliver him. He knew what was being said. Selah. <laughs> so let's pause for a minute. These catastrophic situations still happen to believers today. I, I read about a guy recently who was a Christian, had a partner, quote unquote Christian. This guy rarely ever took a vacation, but he planned a two-week getaway with his wife, and uh, they took off. He came back, and 
his partner had lawyered up and uh, basically stolen the business from him and pulled it off. Someone that he thought he could trust, someone that he thought was his friend, someone that he thought was loyal. That's a catastrophe. Uh, it could be a marriage. You think your partner's committed, but then you find out one horrible day that there's not commitment. You've had the words, but not the heart. And now you've got the proof, and now you've got the evidence. Uh, it could be something that happens with one of your kids or a, a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law. I, I know of a situation where a really pretty solid Christian family the oldest son met a gal at a Christian college, and, you know, everybody's excited, and she came from a quote-unquote wonderful family, and they got married, and she moved that guy right out of that family. I mean, he has no contact. There's no contact of this family over here, godly people with grandchildren because of the wife that family's, I, 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 I have talked to this father twice in 10 years. He had a broken heart 10 years ago. I saw him a few months ago. He's still got a broken heart. This stuff happens. It's catastrophic when it happens. And what happens is, because of circumstances and whatever it might be, whatever kind of situation what it is, it's catastrophic, and there's really not much you can do about it because you're, you're outnumbered, you're overwhelmed, you might be outlawed, you're out of options. That's a very hard place to be. You find yourself in a hopeless situation, utterly hopeless. I remember many, many, many years ago, we moved across the country, got involved in a ministry. It all really looked promising. Prayed about it for a year. The, the, the Lord was clearly leading. I remember we had been there about a year and it just blew up. It just blew up for reasons that now seem very, very small, but it blew up. And I remember sitting on the front porch, and my kids were small, and Mary was on the phone with her mom, and I'm sitting there watching our, my kids, and I'm thinking, why did you bring me halfway across the country for this? It, and I knew it couldn't be repaired. It could not be fixed. I was actually going to write my doctoral dissertation at Dallas Seminary on the ministry project we were doing because it was very unique and it was going to be a new model. I was very proud of it. <laughs> Maybe that was the problem. And it just blew up. I mean, it blew. And it was, there was no recovery. And I was hemmed in. Mary and I were supposed to go to a do a marriage conference that weekend. And I said, you know, why don't we not go to this conference and just stay here? No, you, you go ahead. You go ahead. We'll work it out when you get back. I said, okay. I got a call. You better get back here. Big things, because things are developing very, very quickly. I remember that very well. And I had to speak the next morning. And I had to speak to a group of men on being a biblical leader of your family. And it was very hard for me to get through that talk because my mind wasn't there. But at the end, something really unusual happened. A guy came up to me, the very first guy up to me came up and said, what have you written on this subject? I said, nothing. You mean what I just talked about on being a biblical, a, a spiritual leader for your family? Yeah. What have you written on this? I said, nothing. He said, what has been written? I said, I don't really know of anything that comes to mind. This was 86, 87. 
And he goes, oh, okay. Second guy comes up to me. Uh, what have you written on this? Third guy, what have you written on this? Fourth guy, what have you written on this? Between, I didn't count them, but between 10 and 15 guys asked me that question. No one had ever, and I'd given that talk a lot. No one had ever asked me that question before or after. Just that day, what have you written on this 10 to 15 times? I'm mentioning that to Mary as we were on the plane flying back, and she said, and I said, you know, in regard, I got to go down to Dallas and get a new dissertation project appeared, uh, approved. She said, well, this seems fairly clear, doesn't it? I said, yeah. I need to do something about men. So I came down, got approval. Uh, oh, Steve, this is great. You ought to do some research on men and all this. And I wound up surveying 1,000 men and, you know, writing a dissertation that was about this thick. And, but you see, we still had the issue. These were good men with good wives. We brought in a Christian arbiter to help work it out. I, th I thought I was done. When I walked in, we had some discussion, and the arbiter said, well, here's what these men want to propose. They want you to stay, and they want you to preach on Sundays, but they do not want you coming into the office during the week. I said, okay. So maybe, I don't know, 12, 15 hours, put together a message. What about the rest of the week? Why don't you work, working on that, uh, that dissertation thing at Dallas? And I said, yeah. They said, just do that. You want me to work on that? Yeah, just go ahead, just do it. But don't come into the office. They did not want me giving the Chinese flu to anybody in the office, uh, spiritually speaking. I said, okay. Went down, got the new dissertation approved, so I start doing all this research on men. Never had a clue in my mind that I would spend the next 30 years in men's ministry. It never dawned on me. I'm just trying to come up with a dissertation because I'd put in all these hours and all these classes and I wanted to finish it out. The mind of man plans his way, Proverbs 16 says, but the Lord directs his steps. I never saw that coming. And it wasn't a real positive development where the Lord suddenly said, Steve, I got a great plan for your life. Let's shift this a little bit and have you go into men's ministry and fly around and do all these conferences and write books and do all this. Oh, that'd be great, Lord. Oh, this is wonderful. That's not how it worked. It was, it was boom, 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 boom. It was catastrophic. And every week, the day before the elders meeting, I'd start getting a knot in my stomach because I was afraid they were going to fire me. Uh, and they never did. And then, for the next year and a half, I worked on that dissertation and did all the research on men. And then I um, finished it. But at a conference I was doing, I was introduced to a publisher. He found out that I was doing this project at Dallas. He said, tell me about it. I did. He said, that's a book. You need to write a book. That book became Point Man. First book I ever did. I went back to the elder board and I said, well, I've had a publisher approach me about doing this, doing a book on this. Yeah, yeah, do the book, just do the book. <laughs> looking back on it now, it's all so clear, the plan of God. But you see, I wasn't looking back then, I was in the middle of it and just trying to survive and make sense of a catastrophic loss that had occurred. I didn't know from week to week if I'd have a job. I did not know how to focus and do this research and do this writing. I didn't know how to do it. It was a battle every day because I had so much anxiety. I, this could be over next week. I was hanging by a thread. I was pretty lonely. I was pretty isolated other than my wife. It was, uh, it was a hard time. I finished the book 
And my prayer all along was, Lord, let me just finish this book. I did, and three weeks later, I was asked to move on. And then several years later, with the key individual, we met by chance at a Promise Keepers at the Charlotte Motor Speedway under the 200,000 seat grandstand. And a guy said, Steve, Steve. And I turned and it was that guy. And I thought, shoot, what's he doing here? And he walked up and he said, when I saw you were speaking here, I've been praying ever since then that God would let me run into you. And we had a tremendous 15, 20 minute time together. He asked my forgiveness, I asked his because I'd made mistakes too, and we just got it all worked out. And then we laughed. (laughs) Because when they asked me to leave, there was no promise keepers. There was no men's movement. The only thing they ever, I remember Mary saying, Steve, you got the book out, now you gotta do men's ministry. I said, Mary, I can't do men's ministry. She said, that's your heart. I said, that doesn't matter. No, there's no, you can't do men's ministry full time. What am I going to do, a pancake breakfast in Amarillo every three years? I mean, there's no men's ministry. (laughs) Churches have ministries for everybody in the world except men. That's how it was back then. Now, why am I going in and telling you this whole story? Because... The last word in verse 2 is selah. Pause, reflect, ponder. I've been a Christian since I was seven years old. I am now 70. I've been on the trail for a while. And when you've been on the trail for a while, you begin to see the workings of God and you begin, we talked about this many times in here, and you begin to see that God works strangely. And you begin to see, if you've walked with the Lord for a while, here's what you've seen. Have you gone through some kind of catastrophe? Yeah, you have. I don't know what it is. I don't know what your story is. I don't know if it's health or whatever. But whatever, there's been some catastrophe. There's been some devastating loss. There's been some huge setback. And you were outnumbered. You were overwhelmed. You were outgunned. You were overloaded. You, you were just out of options. And you thought you were finished. And what did God do? He came in and he delivered you. And he made a way for you when there was no possible way. Romans 8, 28, it says, and we know that God works most things together for good for those who love God. That's not what it says. It says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Divorce isn't good, rape isn't good, murder isn't good, bankruptcy isn't good, betrayal isn't good, But you see, God's sovereign over it all, and he has the ability in our lives that when catastrophe strikes, he uses it in some way, fashion, form for our good in his time, in his way. It was good for me that I was afflicted. The way that I want to go, there is a way that seems right to a man, Proverbs 16, what is it, 21 or 25? There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is... Death. I read you the quote from John Newton last week on disappointment. It is a mercy when God crosses our wishes and interrupts our plans. Why? He's got a better plan. So you see, what happens is, as you walk with the Lord, and you'll have more than one catastrophe. It's not constant catastrophe, but you'll have chapters that are tough. And then the Lord will come through and deliver and then what that does is, is what happened to David in verse 3. You've got a catastrophe, but in spite of the catastrophe, you've got confidence. That's the second point. 
in, in verse 3, he says this. But you, O, o Lord, he's going to say three things. But you, O Lord. Yeah, I'm in catastrophe. I got many adversaries. They're saying there's no deliverance for you. I'm, I'm beyond your grace. You won't forgive me. But you have forgiven. See, instead of listening to that nonsense, he looks to the Lord. And what he knows to be true about God, the faithfulness of God. We're up and down. We wander. We're prone to wander. We're prone to leave the God we love. But he is faithful. He is steady. He is steadfast. David says, but you, O Lord, not looking at his adversary. He's not even looking at him. But you, O Lord. Who's your Lord? Who's your God? Who's your master? But you, O Lord. Watch this. Three things. You're a shield about me. You're my protector. You're my protector. Uh, my glory. Uh, anything that I have comes from you, and you get the glory in my life. You have set me up as king over this nation. I didn't do that. You did it. I give glory and honor to your name for that. Third, you're the one who lifts my head. So back in David's day, when kings would go to battle, the winning king, they'd bring in the losing king. The losing king would be put on his face, and the superior king would take his foot and put it on the back of the guy's neck. That's as low as you can go. And David was pretty low right now because Absalom was coming to Jerusalem with an army to pull off the coup, which David never saw coming. And he says, Lord, you're the one who lifts my head. You're the one who has put me in this position. Instead of being downcast, I'm going to be confident because it's you, it's you, it's you. You're in charge of my life. You're the one that I trust, even in this hopeless situation. I put my reputation, I put everything that I have in your hands. Then note the third point. Note in verse four, David cries out to the Lord. I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain, Selah. Selah. What's Selah? It's a pause, ponder, think, consider. Okay? So what should we consider here? Well, let me tell you what David was considering. When he says, I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and literally here to cry to the Lord... I mean, it is a cry from the gut because you are in immense, immense difficulty. You're in the darkest chapter, perhaps, of your life. Uh, you don't see any way through. You don't see any way out. The odds against you are overwhelming. There is no way to come out of this. There's no way, there's no way to escape. Maybe you've screwed up. Maybe someone else has done something with your reputation. I don't know what it is, but there is no cotton-picking way out of this. So what does he do? I cry. I cry out to you. You know, we have these, uh, these little prayers that we just, they kind of, in certain situations, bedtime. Now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep the flesh you have before I wake. Pray the Lord my soul to take. Amen. It's not that kind of prayer. It's not a, Lord, bless this food, the nourishment of my body, and pray with the hands that prepared it in Jesus' name, amen. What? That's just rote memory. This isn't that kind of prayer. This is from the God. God, Jesus, help me. I'm going down. This is not the first time he has cried out to God. Earlier in his life, he was in another catastrophic situation. You know the good things about catastrophic situations? They prepare you for the next ones. <laughs> you learn lessons in catastrophic situations that'll get you through the ones that are coming down the road. And again, it's not, we're not always living in catastrophe, but God uses catastrophe. God uses hardship. God uses heartbreak. God uses devastating loss in our lives to mature us, to build spiritual muscle, to make us into the men he wants us to be. 
not boys, but men, who trust not on ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. So when everyone else is caving and falling apart, you can be steady, you can be confident, you can even have joy, because you know your God, and you've seen him act before, and he is your savior, and he is your deliverer. That's what he does. What does David say? I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me. You call out to God in desperation, he's not going to ignore you. Never. Psalm 57, 2 uh, gives us another little biographical shot on David. You remember David and Saul. David took on Goliath. Goliath was the biggest man of, of the Philistines. Do you happen to know who the biggest man in Israel was at that time? Saul. It was Saul. He was the biggest man. Who should have taken on Goliath? Saul. He didn't do it because he wasn't a man with a heart for God. He, he, was, he, was, all, he was all exterior. There was nothing in his gut. He never did follow God from his heart. Not truly, not really. <clears throat> so David shows up, this shepherd kid, bringing his brother's Subway sandwiches, and he, who's, who's that, who's that Goliath? Who's that uncircumcised reprobate over there? Oh, that's Goliath. He's gonna, well, I'll take him on. God delivered me from the lion. God de delivered me from the bear. See, God prepares his men in secret. In secret. You say, where are the leaders for the next generation? Where's the next leader that we need? In secret somewhere. Oh, believe me, God's always got his men for the time. God fits the man for the time and the time for the man. And he's got David ready. Nobody knew, there was no press clip. David didn't put this on social media, killed the lion. Like? <laughs> Nobody knew about it. But at the right time, God puts him on the platform and he takes that sucker down. And then suddenly, Saul gets jealous because there's a new number one song in Israel. Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Oh, now you got a problem, because now you got a jealous king who wants the glory and wants the credit. And so now he tries to kill David, and David goes on the run to escape Saul. And so what's happening is that David is hiding out from Saul. And if you look at Psalm 57, if you look at the superscription, it says, for the choir director, and then it says, a mikvim of David when he fled from Saul in the cave. So David was on the run from Saul. This was earlier in his life. This was more than likely at a place called En Gedi, which if you go to Israel, you can probably, they'll make a stop at En Gedi. It's near the Dead Sea. It's on the, the mountains going up towards Jerusalem. A very steep narrow canyon. There's a beautiful uh, river flowing down through it. Uh, very rocky, very, uh, you know, you gotta be in a little bit of shape to get up there to this incredible waterfall. But as you're going up, these very narrow and tight, this constricted canyon, uh, it'd be a box canyon. There are caves everywhere. Caves, caves. You can't count the caves. I've never seen anything like that in my life. All these caves, all these hiding places. So the story is, David had, he's hiding in the cave because Saul's got his soldiers, hundreds and hundreds of soldiers, and they're looking for David, and if they find him, they're going to kill him. And David is burrowed in in a cave. And once again, he's outgunned, he's outnumbered, he's overwhelmed. And in Psalm 57 too, you know what he does? He cries out to God. So here's a principle. When you're in that situation, a catastrophic situation, don't get mad at God. Cry out to him. Say, Jesus, I need you now. So in verse 2, Psalm 57, David says, I will cry to God most high. Now, I would say this. This time, he probably didn't cry out externally because they were looking for him. But it was a very loud, intense cry of silence from his gut. Watch this. I will cry to God most high. To God. See, there's no way out. To God who accomplishes 
all things for me. He will send from heaven and save me. And God had made promises to David that one day he would sit on the throne. David believed those promises. And based on what God had promised him, he knew that God would deliver him. And he lived off the promise. I will cry to God most high. But see, sometimes in, in catastrophic situations when you've got people after you, when you've got enemies, and again, I would say that the longer we're alive in this culture in the United States, which is turned so rapidly against the gospel, the more you stand your ground, the more heat you're going to get. And, and you, just, you just need to get prepared and you need to get ready. And you're going to accrue enemies. And you're going to get uh, people that are very angry and will make threats and try to take you down and maybe try to get you to lose your position in your company or to pull your pension or to do this or that. It's happening all over. You know what I'm talking about. And we start looking at those people and sometimes they're officials who have power, they're bureaucracies, uh, they outnumber us, they overwhelm us. Uh, they've got more lawyers. They've got power. They're high. And we lose heart and we get hopeless. David says, I will cry to God most high. I grant you they are high. I grant you they have positions of high responsibility. They may be high. Watch this. He's most high. He's most high. I don't care who they are. <laughs> Isaiah 40, if they're a leader with power, he regards them as meaningless and void. One Puritan pastor translated it this way, I will cry to God most high, to God who is the transactor of all my affairs. He will sin from heaven and save me. This is the greatest stuff in all the world. Jesus is a savior. When he went to the cross, he paid for our sins so that we could be saved from our sin and have eternal life and be put in relationship with him and adopted into his family. That's not the only time he saves us. He just keeps saving us as we walk through life. Overwhelming odds. There's no possible way to get Jesus I don't have a chance. I can't outlaw Jesus. It's what he does. It's who he is. You're not by yourself. He doesn't hang you out to dry. The eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, who hope, wait for his loving kindness. Selah. Selah. Right there at the end of verse 4 in Psalm 3. So rest, ponder, meditate. Uh, this many guys, there's got to be some guys facing catastrophes right now. Selah. Ponder this. Remember it. You're not by yourself. You're not alone. Get all in with Jesus. Don't mess around with sin. Quit lying if you're lying. Come clean. Jump in with everything you have. Why would you not? It's the only thing that makes sense. It's the only thing that's rational. You need him. He's your only hope. And he wants to help. He's there. The eye of the Lord roams to and fro about the earth, looking for those whose hearts are fully his, that he may strongly support them. So David has a little sila. After he cries to the Lord, and now, the next point is, David, in verse 5, has calm. 
He has calm in the midst of catastrophe. Because back in verse 5, he says, I lay down and slept. When you're in a catastrophic situation, sleep is hard to come by, is it not? Anxiety. Anxiety will eat your lunch. But you see, when your eyes are on the living God who is most high, instead of your enemies, it puts things in perspective. Psalm 142.3, when my spirit was overwhelmed within me, you knew my path. I don't see any way out of here. I don't, this is hopeless. But, but see, Lord, I'm not you. Psalm 31, about 15. But as for me, I say that you are my God. I trust in you, O Lord. My times are in your hands. And these are catastrophic times. I don't see any way of escape. But 142, 3 of Psalms, when my spirit's overwhelmed, and it is, you know my path. You know what's next. You know the next chapter. You've already written it for me. I just don't know how I'm going to get there. I don't even know what the chapter is. Ah, but you do. So why the heck don't I go to sleep? When, when I've been in catastrophic situations, I have learned the way to go to sleep is to see law. Scripture. That's, I've had to learn this over the years. And if I'm really tied up in knots about something, I'll take melatonin. Yeah, I do. God invented melatonin. It's an herb or a spy. I don't know what it is. It works for me. But then I'll also meditate on scripture. I'll see law. I got all this anxiety and worry. And like, let's calm it down here. Let's just, let's pause. All right, now think about this. Get perspective here. Get a grip. I don't know what my future holds. They can outlawyer me. They can put me. Okay. Psalm 34, verse 6, 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. The angel of the Lord encamps. He encamps. He's got you. He's got angels around you. Does this mean that nothing bad ever happens to Christians? No, Christians go to jail. You get Christians in jail all over the world for their faith. That's probably coming to us in not too many years. It's already happened to some. But you see, even when that happens, if indeed you wind up as many are in Iran and North Korea and China and Pakistan. It's amazing the faith of those people. It's amazing the joy of those people. They love the word of God that's in their hearts. Uh, Psalm 37.3 in the New American Standard is a favorite of mine. The marginal reading goes like this. Trust in the Lord and do good. When it says do good, what it's talking about is obey the Lord. Walk with him. Don't touch sin. Trust in the Lord and do good. Obey him. Dwell in the land. Watch this. And this is the marginal rendering. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Feed on his faithfulness. That's what you do. You feed on the faithfulness of God. And so many nights, I'll recite that scripture. And I'll recite it. I'll recite it, trust in the Lord and do good. And if, if I have sinned and not confessed his sin, I'll confess it to him. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land. I'm here, Lord. It's where I live. You put me here. If this goes down, I don't know, we can't stay here. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. But when we had that ranch, I had a few cows down in that pasture. And all those suckers did was chew. They ate and they chewed. 
They just, uh, they were always feeding. They were always feeding. So uh, I'm still trying to get to sleep. So then I go back and I take that verse again. Trust in the Lord. And I go, I just go, trust. Just trust, Lord. I just need to trust you. Trust in the Lord. Nothing can thwart what you want to do. My times are in your hand. Trust in the Lord. And rarely would I get three times through that verse. It would calm my heart. It would relax me. So then I'd wake up, and David says, I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. He gives to his beloved even in their sleep. He wakes up from his sleep, and now he's got courage. Verse 6, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Now you're into the tens of thousands. Uh, Up in verse 1, there were many adversaries. They were hundreds, might be a thousand or two. Now he's enumerating them by the ten, what what does he say? Uh, By the ten thousands of people. Many scholars believe that his son attacked with about an army of 20,000. What David did was David went ahead and left Jerusalem just with a small contingent of men and soldiers. The reason he did that was that he didn't want innocent people to be killed in Jerusalem as they came in to try and take him out. So he left and went into the wilderness. Uh, That was his greatest fear, that Absalom would attack, and it became evident that he was going to attack. And this is where the courage of God comes in. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, in one of his books, I think it's Spiritual Depression. And Martin Lloyd-Jones, before he was an eminent pastor, was a a medical doctor. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, you know, when we hit threatening situations and situations that could take us down. And he pastored in London during Hitler's blitzkrieg every night. They didn't know on Sunday how many in their congregation would not be there because they died. It was an every night affair. Lloyd-Jones said, you know, the psychologists will often say to you, they'll say to me, oh, you're worried about this. You're worried about this. Yes, I'm worried this might happen. This is the worst that could probably, this is the worst that could possibly happen. I'm very anxious about this. What if this happens? And the psychologist will say to you, well, you really don't need to think about that because just the very odds are that it won't happen. Don't worry about that. It probably won't happen. And Lloyd-Jones says, that has never helped me. In fact, he said, that's not the perspective of the Bible. The Bible says Don't act like it won't happen. Act like it will. Face it. What is the worst possible scenario that could happen in your life out of these circumstances? And then go ahead and face it, stare it down, write it down. Look at all of us, all of it in its complexity, in its devastation and ruin. Face it. And then know this. If the worst happens... He's still your God, he's still your Savior, he's still your Deliverer, and he still has a plan, and he'll make a way where there is no way, and he will bless you. Yeah, you can temporarily have things taken away, and it's hard, and it's devastating, and we suffer loss and all that, and it hurts. It hurts deeply. I'm not minimizing that. But Job said, even though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Take it all. Take my life. I'll trust you. That's the perspective Face it down. Job lived it. And then lastly, there's a call to battle in verses 7 and 8. When he says, Arise, O Lord, save me, O God. You have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. And some Christians get upset because he's, they're going to require dental surgery when God's done with them. But you know what? These people are not only against David, they're against the Lord. And the Lord is a judge. And he's putting them in God's hands. There is a price to rebellion against God Almighty, and there is a judgment. 
And Absalom needed to be taken down, and he was taken down. Verse 8, salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. So I got an email um, today. But I got news, Mary and I did, concerning some friends of ours, longtime friends in ministry in Colorado. Uh, they had just, their, 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 one of their sons just married before Christmas. And, uh, but New Year's Eve, a friend, Roy, just had this hacking cough and, you know, all this stuff's going around. But he, he's just coughing, and he coughs so violently, he cracked a couple of ribs. And he was spitting up some blood. So he was in the hospital. And they find out that he's got cancer of the lungs. Never smoked in his life. But he's got stage four cancer in his lungs. Right now they're at MD Anderson. Uh, he's got it in his liver. He's got it in his brain. He's got it everywhere. And this guy's been healthy as a horse. Just running on all cylinders for the Lord, having a great impact. I mean, it was shocking news. Um, I, we, we, got, we got the news on that yesterday, and so we've been praying. And every time I pray for Roy, and you say, well, you know, could the Lord heal him? Sure, of course, and wouldn't that be great? Does the Lord always heal Christians with stage four cancer? No. This may be Roy's time of promotion to go to be with the Lord. Even though he's still a young guy and has been in good health, right around 60. So every time I have prayed for Roy in the last 24 hours, I prayed that God would give him and Margaret God's peace. And early this morning, an email came through from Roy and saying, hey, uh, we've set up a website just to keep everybody in the loop, da, 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 and it'll be up later today, and you can get all the information. Thanks for your prayers. Before I sign off, I just want to tell you this. We're so aware of the peace of God in our hearts. The peace which passes all understanding. Boy, that's answered prayer. Will, the, will, will Roy be delivered? Oh, yeah. Oh, you say he's going to be healed. That I don't know. He might die. But I'll tell you what, if he does, it's salvation. And it's a promotion. We tend not to think that way, but I will tell you this. If the Lord takes Roy and 20 minutes later the Lord, Lord said, you know, Roy, would you like to go back? <laughs> Are you kidding me? That's the truth. That's the truth. Jesus reigns even in the midst of catastrophe. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word, for the power of it. That David, under inspiration of your spirit, wrote these things 3,000 years ago. And they're as real and as applicable to where we are today as they've ever been to believers before us. Encourage us with these words. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.